welcome to this video on Girl Investors. I quite enjoy some of the courses on the Great Courses Plus website, and one of the most fascinating courses I listened to was from Stephen Novella titled Your Deceptive Mind. So in this video, we will review the top 10 concepts I learned or liked, and this video is not sponsored, and I purchased the course with my own money. So as investors, the way we perceive the world, meaning everything we think, we see, we hear and experience, is not a direct recording of the outside world and is rather a construction. So information that we consume is altered, it's distorted, compared and confabulated, ultimately to be woven into a narrative that fits our assumptions about the world. So being aware of how our thinking can be flawed and to question assumptions is crucially important to our success as professionals and investors. Human beings are subject to delusions. We are prone to cognitive biases. If you don't know what cognitive biases are, cognitive biases are a subconscious tendency to think in a certain way. Or, they're, or another way to think about it is that they're mental shortcuts to help the brain process information and make decisions. A specific term for a mental shortcut is a heuristic, which is a cognitive rule of thumb, if you will, or a mental shortcut that we subconsciously make that may be true much of the time, but it's not really logically valid. And if so, if you're interested in learning more about cognitive biases and heuristics, then I invite you to hit the like button and please keep watching. The most important bias is number one, so be sure to watch all the way to, to the end of the video. Before we get into the top 10 list, let's talk about reflective reasoning versus reflexive reasoning. So reflective reasoning is a logical approach to decision making, which is slow and requires effort. When we use logic to make decisions, we seek to exclude emotions and only use rational methods, perhaps even mathematical models. And if you're aware of Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow, this would be like system two. And reflexive reasoning is an emotional approach to decision making. An emotional decision is typically very fast and reactive and largely subconscious. For example, this could mean making decisions or statements in a heated argument or when faced with immediate danger. And reflexive reasoning is synonymous with system one from Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. So as investors and professionals, we should be aware that we have these two types of reasoning. And while we might need to make quick decisions sometimes, reflective reasoning could help you overcome cognitive biases that we're going to talk about soon. So as an investor, do you think it's better to do more reflective reasoning or reflexive reasoning? Leave a comment below and tell us why. Number 10, representative heuristic. A representative heuristic is making judgments based on the representativeness or a set of characteristics about something. This is similar to stereotyping. This mental shortcut, however, can lead to errors in thinking. An example of a representative heuristic is making a judgment about a person based on their appearance, such as looking at a person's home to make a judgment about their socioeconomic status, or looking at a person's clothing and accessories to make a judgment about whether or not they would be a good hire for your company. Number nine, availability heuristic. The availability heuristic is what, imme what is immediately accessible to us and what we can think of, we assume must be the most important and, the, and influential. The assumption is that if we can think of an example of something, then that must be common or representative. It also gives weight to events that are recent, vivid, personal, and emotional. For example, doctors might remember the recent dramatic cases, though they shouldn't assume that what happened with that patient is representative of patients with that condition in general because it's a biased data set. Or an investor might remember his recent loss on a stock pick and decide that, you know what, investing is too risky. This is similar to anecdotal evidence. Essentially, anecdotes are experiences that we personally have in our everyday lives that are not part of a controlled or experimental condition, but we use them as a method for estimating probability. So for example, if we're trying to estimate how common COVID-19 is spreading in the community, we will tend to think of examples of people who we know who have been infected with COVID-19 and conclude that it probably isn't very common and the media and health officials are hyping these infection rates. On the flip side, if we are continuously exposed to disasters and crimes on the news, we might think that they are actually so much more common than they actually are, meaning even if they're rare events. So be careful how you consume media content. 
Number eight, exemplars. An exemplar is a case that viv vividly represents a phenomenon based making it seem more likely, common, or significant. Exemplars tend to have a greater influence on our judgments than statistical information about the statistical rate at which things occur. Exemplars reflect the human storytelling bias. So for example, your friend might tell you about the time she was robbed in a market in a foreign country, and as a result, you might avoid traveling to that country because clearly you don't want to get robbed. Number seven. Escalation of commitment. Escalation of commitment is a fascinating heuristic. Once a person commits to a decision, he tends to stick to that commitment. It's similar to the ownership effect. You might evaluate something as higher because you invested in it. So therefore, that feeling biases all later judgments about your investment. For example, if you own a house, you might value it higher than a prospective buyer. This is loosely connected to the exposure effect, which is the tendency to more favorably rate things or beliefs with, with which we are more familiar. Number six, choice supportive bias. Escalation of commitment is similar to choice supportive bias. A choice supportive bias is a bias where once we make a decision, we then assess that decision in a more favorable light. This is a way of relieving some of the anxiety or angst over whether or not we made the right decision. For example, if you purchase a Tesla car, then you will have a tendency to rate the vehicle much more favorably than you did prior to deciding on the purchase. Essentially, the buyer will justify a decision she made as a positive decision. And interestingly, the choice supportive biases could also lead to the buyer downgrading his assessment of the second item on her list. For example, when her decision comes down to three stock positions, she might decide to go with the first pick and will justify that decision by increasing her assessment of her, of her first stock pick and downgrading her assessment of the second stock pick. This was shown in an experiment where subjects were told that number one is no longer available what are you going to take as a, as a replacement? And subjects skipped over their second choice instead and selected the prior third choice because they've already invested mental effort in downgrading their second choice. So sometimes it might not be a bad thing to be in third place. Number five, fundamental attribution error. This is a psychological term that refers to the tendency to ascribe the actions of others to internal motives and attributes rather than external situational factors. For example, if an investor's stock pick resulted in a precipitous loss, we might be likely to explain the action of that stock picker based on her less than stellar skill set. On the flip side, if it was our stock pick that declined, we might be likely to blame it on external or situational factors and downplay any personality defaults that we could have or skills. Number four, anchoring. Anchoring is the tendency to focus disproportionately on one feature or aspect of an item or phenomenon and base judgments on that one feature. For example, in a roundtable meeting, the first person who states an opinion can influence the opinions of the subsequent people sitting at that table. So the second, third, and fourth people who speak after the first speaker could essentially agree with that first speaker. Number three, the effort heuristic. This heuristic is similar to the escalating investment heuristic and tells us that we value items more if they require greater effort to obtain. If you think a little bit about this mental shortcut, you can see that it's not logical. We may obtain something easily that happens to be highly valuable. For example, we could value a stock that we purchased higher rather than if the restricted stock units were given to us as part of a compensation package. Psychologists call this the found money effect. I think it's because of this heuristic that some people tend to play hard to get in various situations. Number two, sharpshooter fallacy. The sharpshooter fallacy is choosing the criteria for success specifically to match the results that are already known. This is actually a common statistical fallacy. The name alludes to an analogy of shooting a gun at the side of a barn and then drawing a target around the hole claiming that you shot a perfect bullseye. 
This fallacy is quite common when interpreting clinical trials for drugs. Companies might select criteria or, or interpret the significance of those criteria after they know what the results are, and this is also commonly known as post hoc analysis. It's similar to data mining. Now we're down to number one, confirmation bias. I love this one. So while this course wasn't the first time I heard about confirmation bias, I think this is such an important bias that we are all prone to unless we remain vigilant. We tend to accept information and events that support our beliefs and interpret them favorably. We will even seek out information that supports our beliefs and discredit information that doesn't support our beliefs. I see this one quite often in biotech investing on Twitter. On BioTwitter, analysts who are interpreting clinical trial results for a company they like and whose stock they own, they seem to accept the findings and conclusions of the study as good and a solid study. And in contrast, if it is a company they dislike or they are short the company, meaning they hope the stock price will fall, then they will scrutinize the conclusions much more carefully and they try to find potential flaws in the study design and try to dismiss the conclusion. And depending on which side of the coin they're on, the analysts will then expend a great deal of time and effort finding reasons to rationalize the data. We tend to notice only the evidence that confirms our beliefs, and we are cherry picking bits of data from many potential data. Therefore, it behooves us to systematically re review data before we draw conclusions about it. An example of a confirmation bias is that some people believe that they can always tell when a woman has had cosmetic surgery, such as Botox or fillers, because when they see a woman with a particular type of cosmetic surgery, they take that as confirmation of their ability. However, they did not account for the fact that they didn't notice when they didn't recognize, double negative there, cosmetic surgery because that data is completely missing from their data set. I like to be aware of cognitive biases and heuristics so that I can better notice it in myself. I'm not perfect, but I don't want to make such errors which could negatively impact my professional and investment decision making. So leave a comment below on which bias you found most interesting. As always, if you like this video, please click the like button and subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully we'll see you in our next video.